Let me start from Mr. Torero. Uh, uh, Mr. Torero, what does it mean to build uh, mm, uh, an agri-food system that is sustainable and resilient to climate change? Uh, th thank you so much. Uh, it is uh, resilient, has to be resilient and sustainable to shocks. And one of the major shocks that we expect are climate change shocks, which could go from extreme temperatures to flooding, but especially also to increasing variability, what we call the second moment, the variance of temperatures and climate will change, which will make more difficult to make decisions. And this could affect uh, food availability. We have some, uh, some problem uh, with the audio. Mr. Torero, uh, I'm sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, now we can listen to you. Uh, you were talking about the, the uh, need to, to build a, um, a food system resilient to climate change. Yes, exactly. What I was referring to is that we need to look at two elements on climate change. One is extreme temperatures and flooding, like it was mentioned before. But the second one is increasing variability of temperatures and weather, which will affect the decision making of farmers and the whole food system. Normally, when we talk about resilience, we have been normally focusing on the individual household or farm, but not in the food system. That's a, a new concept that we need to look at it. And we call it agri-food system because it, all the production in the agricultural sector is not only for food, it's also for other activities like fibers and so on. Now, what it means to be resilient in the system, it has to comply with two elements. One is to minimize the risks, and that's the vulnerab vulnerabilities. And the second one is to cope with the risks when they occur, and that's capabilities. And to minimize the risk, uh, we need to find ways in which we can improve our early warning system so that countries can be prepared and can be planned in advance. And that requires data and significant innovation in the way we collect data so that we can have early warning systems that have predictive power. But we also need to look at the One Health approach because many of the issues that we will be facing because of changes in temperature and humidity will be linked to health issues, like what we are observing today on COVID-19, but also on other zoonotic diseases that will come up. So we need to look at this One Health approach to try to minimize those potential risks. And finally, we need to find ways in which, uh, in terms of minimizing risks, to increase the capacity of farmers to have insurance in place and insurance that they can adopt. Normally, we have been using index weather insurance, for example, and the adoption rate has been very low. But there is a lot of innovation happening now. Now, to cope with the risk, which is the second element of a resilient system, we need to look at social protection and how we can expand a smart system of social protection that can target when you have different shocks affecting different areas. Our social protection system today is cumbersome and, and normally will target areas that are normally being affected but cannot shift. And COVID-19 showed us that, that when we have new hotspots, it's very difficult to improve and to move quickly in terms of social protection. We need to align incentives uh, so that incentives are designed in such a way that we can target proper interventions. And we need to booster mechanisms to increase access to intra-regional trade and to increase uh, reduce food safety issues so that trade can be more open so that you can have different outlooks, both to import and also to trade your commodities when different countries are, are being affected. And this is linked also to infrastructure development that we have forgotten a little bit, but it's extremely important to keep working on infrastructure and also value chain infrastructure, which is a way to move forward. And digital technologies can play a crucial role there. Uh, finally, it's important to understand that to understand the resilience in the food system, we need to answer the question of resilience for what, which are the chops that we need to look, resilience of what, and this is the system that we want to touch, and what we are going to achieve with that resilience, which is basically not only being where we were before the shock, but also if we, it is possible to keep improving over where we were before. Thank you. Mr. Torero, uh, food crises are uh, still mainly, but not only, uh, concentrated in uh, one continent, Africa. Why is that? Uh, the food crisis today is, is concentrated across the board. It's not only in, in Africa. Even Africa had started later, and we don't have a, a, a food crisis in, in the whole region of Africa. We have food crisis which is concentrated in a group of territories within Africa. And in our last report uh, that we just issued together with WFP, uh, we have shown that uh, the global report on food crisis showed that 155 million people were in crisis or worse, which is IPC phase three or above, which is equivalent to 55 countries, uh, and most of them are in Africa. But the, the reason why they're in Africa is not only because of climate issues, but also because of conflict, which is one of the major reasons behind, behind a food crisis, and also because of a slowdowns on economic downturns. 
And if to that you add the locus problem that we are just trying to, to move away from, plus the COVID-19 problem, that exacerbates the situations in those locations. Now, if we look at the raising the information we have received in terms of the food insecurity experience scale, we are observing also that many countries in southern part of Latin America and in Central America are facing a significant problem of food insecurity at this point. They are in what we categorize as severe food insecurity, and it's because of the COVID-19 crisis and the sequential level of lockdowns that these countries have been facing. If we talk about these 55 countries that are in Africa, we have 17.7 .7 million Africans face emergencies, 171 million face stress, or IPC2, and around 100 million people are already expected to face high levels of acute food insecurity. Now, the, the governance fragilities that we have in, in Africa are essential here. And as I mentioned before, the key drivers behind the food insecurity in these countries in Africa are conflict, economic shocks, and weather and extreme events. In the case of conflicts, we have 53.5 million Africans across 11 countries. In the case of economic shocks, 36.4 million across 16 countries. And in the case of weather extreme, 8 million people in 11 African countries in 2020. So those are the key drivers behind, and some of them are very complex to, to manage, like, for example, the case of conflict. The, the other two, the, the economic shocks and, and the weather extremes, is something that we can cope with resilience. But for the conflict, we have to coordinate more and improve governance to try to minimize. And of course, conflict is also related to economic development, and that's something that we need to work extremely hard to try to, to minimize those problems. Uh, you have just talked about uh, uh, innovation. Uh, do you think that innovation and technology uh, could have uh, <clears throat> could play a key role to improve uh, food security? Innovation, data, and innovation in data and digitalization uh, and technology plays a crucial role. Our accelerators right now in our new strategy in FAO is, is data, real-time data innovation and technology and institutions, which are also central to avoid that this innovation and this technology is inclusive and doesn't exclude others to participate. Now, why is this so, so important? Because first, we need to increase productivity and we need to increase productivity with a constraint, which is the environment. We cannot continue increasing productivity just doing intensification and damaging more our environment. We have very scarce access to water. We have very scarce access to land and good quality land. And we also need to minimize emissions. And the only way we we're going to achieve that is through technological innovation, which has to be science driven. And we have to combine. We, there is always this, this uh, just a position between uh, what we call agroecology and, and biotechnology, but they don't need to compete with each other. They can complement each other. And depending on the location and the area where you are, we can combine both of them to be able to create that. And that's what will allow us to resolve a major problem, which is access to healthy diets, which 3 billion people today don't have access to healthy diets. And also, Technology and innovation will allow, will allow us to have a production which is more resilient in terms of the technology being used, seeds which are more drought resistant, seeds, seeds that use less water, which will allow us to, damage, to manage in a more efficient way the, the resources that, that, that we have. Digital technologies is also playing a crucial role in many dimensions. It's a multidimensional aspect. It's playing a crucial role to, to make uh, value chains to come closer to markets. That's the e-commerce transformation that we have observed during COVID-19. It's also playing a crucial role in trade. Blockchain is allowing us to do traceability of commodities and also to improve the traceability of food safety issues, which is essential to, to promote uh, intra-regional trade. And there are many examples of, of ACTEC enhancing uh, food security in Africa. For example, we have the Africa Mart is, is located in Senegal, which made inroads to Cote d'Ivoire, Burkina Faso, Ghana, Nigeria, Mali, Morocco. And they provide logistics and supply chain manager tools, offering easy ways to access to market. We have Apollo Agriculture in Nairobi uh, and many other innovations which are happening today. But the important thing here is that we need to be very careful that these innovations are inclusive. And that's why I was referring to the fourth accelerator in addition to data, technology and innovation, which is institutions and governance. We need to have institutions in place to assure that whatever technology or innovation is done or data that is generated is inclusive and includes the smallholders, which are the majority. If we don't have that in place, then the only thing that we will do is we are going to continue exacerbating differences. Digital technology is a clear example of this, because in digital technologies, we still have a huge digital divide, especially in rural areas. No matter you see a lot of cellular phones, but the divide is enormous, and it's because 
you can have different types of access. No, uh, you can have 2G, 3G, 5G, and also and broadband. No? If you don't have broadband, the velocity and the capacity of the information you transfer is lower, and that increases the divide. So we need to find a mechanism to provide access to everybody of good technologies so that this information can flow and we don't exacerbate the differences. And for that, institutions and regulation and human capital, which is trained to be able to respond to these changes in technologies is central. One of the things that we are observing right now, which have accelerated because of COVID-19 is automation. And automation requires certain skills. And in Africa, for example, we have a huge labor force a youth labor force that doesn't have right now the skills that are unemployed. So we have to accelerate the process of building capacities so that this labor force will adapt to this new labor demand, which will be required because of this automation that will affect continents in Africa, which is already starting. So again, the four accelerators are central. Innovation, data, real-time data, technology, but also the complements, which includes the institutions, the regulatory agencies, and the human capital development and governance so that we make this transformation inclusive.